So I'm Adib. Uh, I work on OpenPilot. And I'm going to talk about uh, mostly testing, but uh, as Alex said, there's going to be a couple of fun announcements at the end. So we're going to talk about uh, quality and how we don't break stuff. <laughs> because uh, OpenPilot's getting to be a big project. And we support two hardware platforms now with two different operating systems, one based on Android and one based on Ubuntu. We do roughly monthly releases that are fairly large. This one in particular was a recent one that was pretty large. Um, this one. So these are a couple of the releases that we did recently. Um, they're pretty big. Um, we have a small team. We support 132 cars as of today, um, various brands. And we have over 200 plus contributors in the last, well, since last January, um, since we went, since we changed the development style, and we develop publicly now. So how do we not break stuff? This is a commit from 2016, and we had a dream back then. <laughs> One day we'll have CI. And then here we are, July 2021. Um, so these are some randomly sampled desks um, at the office, and you'll notice uh, there are no common devices on these desks. Um, they're just computers. They're uh, built-in workstations, and uh, this is largely our development workflow now. Um, we sit at desks, not in cars anymore. And the answer to how we don't break stuff is um, we have automated regression testing and unit testing. We do hardware in the loop tests. We do offline checks. Um, for, for anomaly detection, and we do online checks um, on the device. So the testing goals for OpenPilot are enforcing quality, reducing the time spent in cars, um, as we showed with that picture on the desks, and efficiently scaling a small team. Uh, because the OpenPilot team is about three full-time people with a research team um, that is now four full-time people. And we have a very concrete goal of 1,000 hours mean time between failure for 1.0. So some of the automated checks we do, um, these are the public ones at least. Um, we have a GitHub Actions test suite that runs unit tests, um, this test process replay that's fairly important, and we do these uh, car unit tests that are also pretty important. Uh, then we have um, a Jenkins server that runs our hardware in the loop tests, where we have comma threes and comma twos um, going on road, running real segments, um, doing replays, and um, enforcing things like, are the timings as good as we want? Um, is the CPU usage exactly as we expect it to be? Uh, things like that. And then uh, you guys have probably seen the online checks if you've used OpenPilot. Um, Sometimes you'll get a fan malfunction. Sometimes you get a GPS malfunction. It'll say contact support, and then what do people do? They go to Discord. But <laughs> when the alert works, you should contact support. Um, and we try really hard to make these alerts and be very aggressive about it, but also um, prevent the stuff from going out in the field. Um, but yeah, we do some pretty extensive checking across um, all the different services in OpenPilot. We make sure that uh, all the services are alive, they're healthy, and their sources for data are also healthy. So if um, like one of the sensors is bad, for example, this will propagate all the way through, the, through location D, through the planner, and controls will say, OK, we can't engage now, or we have to disengage now. Um, and then this is uh, one of our more important tests that runs in GitHub Actions. Um, it's called Process Replay. And we can deterministically um, replay segments through routes, or through uh, processes. And we can take um, the same set of inputs and assure that we get the same set of outputs. And if we don't, we generate these nice diffs, as you can see here. Um, so this is a diff for one of, uh, for actually the new model that we just uh, tried to ship in 087, but we had to revert, uh, which will hopefully ship soon. But this is the diff that it generated. Um, we switched to, um, some different lead packets and stuff. So you'll notice the difference here. It tells you exactly what changed. And we can know, given two different commits, um, what will the outputs of this 
particular open pilot service be? Um, did they change in, in the ways that we expected? Um, or did they not change? So a lot of times we'll do a refactor where we expect that nothing changes. Um, and this is pretty important because we can do things like uh, we can review PRs really quickly. Um, you read the diff, you make sure the diff is reasonable. Um, you do your diligence there. But if the green check mark is there on GitHub Actions, you can be reasonably certain that this did not change any behavior of the tested open pilot processes. And this runs on all the driving processes. Um, so there's six critical driving processes, and this covers all of them, and some other ones. Then we do um, some car unit tests. And these car tests are super important for scaling to these 132 cars that we haven't really touched. So we have six cars at the office right now. We've probably touched somewhere in the neighborhood of a few dozen cars over the lifetime of the company. Um, but all the other ones come through pull requests. Pull requests that are fairly small, but uh, it's still important to make sure that these cars work because we sell devices, we want to ensure quality, and uh, there's really no reason not to. We invested uh, quite a bit of time in making these very reliable unit tests, and now we can be reasonably certain that every car that OpenPile has a test route for functions to some degree. We can't, we don't necessarily check driving behavior, but we check system behavior. Will this car throw a canner? Will the frequency checks work on this car? Um, will Panda Safety agree with OpenPilot? Um, because if this isn't true, um, as you heard in Robes talk, the Panda will just block the messages. So this asserts some very basic behavior and allows us to effortlessly scale to uh, the next milestone in cars, which maybe is 250, 1,000 cars. And then this is uh, part of our suite of offline anomaly detection. So we have uh, a pipeline stage called Find Interesting that runs on all the incoming data. Um, and this runs on those queue logs that um, anybody who runs OpenPilot uploads. Um, and these are some tiny logs that we get a lot of information about all the devices in the field. Um, we can, so this is, this is like a real screenshot from our dashboards that we have up in the middle of the office. Um, so you can see right now, some of the top errors are with um, some, there's some Panda stuff. There's some Camera D stuff on the Comet 2. There's some, a little bit of poor model timings on release. Um, and we have this cool iteration loop we do with Find Interesting where we aggressively log everything that we want, that we expect to happen with OpenPilot. And then we look at it and Find Interesting and we look at the data that comes in. And if this isn't happening, it's going to show up and find interesting, and it's going to be one of these top things. Oops. Clickers are hard. Oh yeah, there we go. So you see that these panda errors are dominating right now. A year ago, it used to be overheats, can errors, all these other things. Um, but every release, we look at the top few things, and we fix them. And then you just end up with a way more reliable system when you're tracking the things that you care about. Because if we don't track these things, they're going to regress. Um, and this is our testing closet. You may have heard about it. It's a little bit of a strange name. But uh, the name comes from the closet it was originally housed in, um, in the original comma house. And you can, see, you can see some comma threes here running different branches. Um, you can see some comma twos. Um, these comma twos are running a NeoS update that was supposed to ship in uh, a previous release, but that didn't make the cut because of some things we found in Find Interesting that I'll show you in the next slide. Um, but this is how we verify um, something like the long tail reliability in that um, there's no reason OpenPilot shouldn't just run if we, if we connect it to a, what we call a jungle. And this allows us to essentially emulate the behavior of uh, being in a car and driving around. There's no reason it shouldn't run um, for days and weeks and months. And these comma twos here have been running for uh, a little over four weeks so far. Um, this was with, obviously, a version of OpenPilot from about a month ago. But um, we update these devices fairly often, and we were able to be reasonably confident about um, the reliability and behavior of these devices and OpenPilot um, because of the data we get back from the testing closet. Here's some plots from the testing closet. These are diffs of uh, consecutive messages from different OpenPilot servers. So we have Calibration D's message. We have one from Dmodern Model D. Uh, we have one from the planner. And we have one from Dmodern Model D. 
Um, so these are four different open pilot processes that we're looking at messages from. And we can see that the timings are, they're, they're pretty good for the planner. Um, they're a little bit worse for uh, demodering model D. And then you'll see uh, demodering D and demodering model D um, follow because they're driven by each other. But uh, we can assert some timings, as we can see in the next slide. So this is the timings of board D. So board D is a process that talks to the panda um, in your car. So that's, um, you have, if you remember from Robe's talk, you have uh, your comma device, the comma two or a three now, and you have the panda, which is built into the device, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a distinct device. Um, and we talk to it over USB on both devices right now. And this timing is super important because it drives the rest of the stack. The camera and uh, the panda drive the stack, essentially. And that's why camera D and board D are super important for um, latency and real-time performance. So if board D is performing poorly, the rest of the processes that um, rely on board D are going to perform poorly. So it just controls the, which is what actually talks to your car. So we worked really hard to get these timings to the point where it doesn't miss a cycle anymore. Um, and then this is why we didn't ship that NeoS update a couple of releases ago. There's still a PR open for NeoS 18. Um, about a year ago, we wrote this daemon that fixes um, these random can errors where you would get lags on comma twos um, randomly, where it would seem that board D just wouldn't, get, wouldn't run for uh, dozens of milliseconds, and then you, you get these lags um, because of our strict online checks. So you can see out in the long tail here, you have it lagging for almost 100 milliseconds. Um, and it does this um, quite a few times. And if we go back to the previous slide, it never does this. So this is some of the behavior we assert in the testing closet. Um, so it's pretty important for assuring that we don't ship progressions um, and that we're hitting the targets that we aim to. And this is pretty cool. So we sh all of the GitHub action tests that we run on our repo, you can run on your repo too. We put the effort in to the point where you can click the fork button and then you click allow actions and you will have um, a large portion of our, of our testing infrastructure running on your fork. If you're a, there's many popular fork maintainers out there um, who have sometimes hundreds of users. Um, and you have all this testing infrastructure that we've built up. You can, if you do, uh, if you support cars that we're never gonna support, for example, the Mazdas that have the steering lockout, um, we don't intend to support these cars, or at least claim uh, that they're an open pilot experience, but you can, you can reach uh, as much as you can. Like, you can support the car to almost the full extent that we can um, by using the test infrastructure that we have. And it, it's really, you click this one button, you go into the settings for your, your fork repo, and you enable GitHub Actions. Um, now we're gonna talk about Panda testing. So we have two goals for Panda. Um, it should enforce the functional safety um, that we've defined for OpenPilot, and it should enforce the hardware functionality. Um, so, you know, you tell the Panda to send this CAN message, it just sent the CAN message. So. Here's an overview of the testing infrastructure for Panda. We do unit tests, again, in GitHub Actions. We do replay tests, where we take um, a segment, and it, it's a very similar to process replay, where we assert that the behavior hasn't changed um, from commit to commit. And then we do some static analysis. Um, Robo talked a little bit about Misra, I think, in his Q&A, and ISO 262. Um, so our unit tests and our static analysis um, go a long way to cover the uh, code rigor that we, up that we uphold in Panda um, that isn't necessarily um, a goal of OpenPilot. And then we have hardware and loop tests that run on the whole zoo. So they run on every Panda that we've ever made from white, gray, black, uno, dos. So our safety unit tests are pretty cool because you can write all the functional safety you need for a brand new carport and you can write a test for it. And on average, the test is about 165 lines, um, which is something you could reasonably do in an afternoon or, uh, or a weekend. And you can develop functional safety for your brand new carport um, and verify its functionality without ever going in a car or even doing a replay. Um, 
So I think this is incredibly cool. And we, we have tests for all these cars, all these safety modes that ship an open pilot release. Um, and this runs for every hardware combination of every car we support. So we support 132 cars. We support quite a few pandas. That's, that's a lot of combinations. And then we do hardware in the loop tests. Um, we assert things like can latency, can loop back. Um, this essentially maintains that if I send out a message, do I get it back? Um, and we can do this with multiple pandas. We use um, something I'll talk about a little bit later, the panda jungle. And we also um, do some checks with the car harness that we're correctly detecting ignition, all this other kind of stuff. And then I want to talk a little bit about production, building devices, because um, this is also pretty cool. Uh, George talked a little bit about screen calibration. Um, this is some of the stuff we've just gotten to do because we've gotten really good at testing these devices that we can do the fun stuff. Uh, we'll go back. So after your common device is built, what happens? So we flash it with NeoS or Agnos, um, depending on whether you have a common two or three. We do some initial checks to filter out defective units. Um, and then we have this provisioning stage, which runs uh, quite a few tests and asserts all the hardware functionality um, that we design our common devices for. And then we have a 24-hour stress test um, that George talked a little bit about in his presentation. Um, and this is, this is how we're working towards building these really incredible devices um, that I think you guys will get, hopefully, uh, after the first shipment on Thursday. So this is our provisioning stage. So this is what happens after our flashing. And we do that um, initial check. We make sure there's nothing obviously wrong, like does it have all the sensors or is it missing the modem? After it passes those basic checks, it goes on to final provisioning. And these are some very early comma threes. Um, and we started writing these tests fairly early on. Um, we wrote these tests a couple months ago, and we've really iterated on them in the last couple of weeks. But um, these are some old revisions of the comma three. And they, um, you can see some of them failed. Some of them are, are still running the test, and some of them passed, but it's cut off. Um, and we verify things like sensors. Um, is Wi-Fi working? Is LTE working? Um, are all the things the right firmware versions that we expect? Is the camera in focus? And this is becoming more important with the Comma 3 because we focus the cameras ourselves. We have a lot of control over the process, but this means there's a lot more that can go wrong. So um, testing becomes a little bit more important in some aspects of the Comma 3. Then we also do some testing with the Panda, the internal Panda, um, so the Uno and DOS in your Comma 2s and 3s. Um, and we, we can basically be confident about all the hardware that we're shipping out um, just based off this quick test. This test runs um, in a couple minutes, and it uh, asserts all the instantaneous functionality we can check. We do some, <laughs> there's a, in the daughter board that George talked about in his uh, presentation that goes on top of that, uh, that modem on the Comma 3. There's a, there's a beeper, and that fires when you uh, device powers off, essentially, um, while it's still engaged. And uh, there's, we do tests like that. We, you hear these all throughout the office. Uh, we, we go through a lot to test these devices. Um, we have some really cool tests um, with that. And then uh, it also does the server registration. And then we do the stress test. Um, so this one's pretty cool because we have all sorts of different failures we caught on the stress test. Um, we check for temperature. This one used to be super, um, super important in Comma 2 because the device would fail a lot. Um, we check for GPS accuracy now. We do um, a lot of camera checks, like are we dropping frames? Uh, are we getting any errors from the camera at all? This indicates some kind of assembly defect um, where a screw isn't screwed in all the way, stuff like this. Um, and we have these very strict checks. Um, and it runs for continuous 24 hours. No like, ah, if it happens two times, eh, we'll let it pass. These are super strict at it turns red when it fails. It's, uh, it's alarming. We pull it off the rig, and it goes back in the production process. Um, and then this is a pretty cool um, chart. So we ship the comma twos with uh, some, some testing that we could think of beforehand. But there was a lot of unexpected failures with them. And a lot of the tests were written after things happened in the field. And then we found out that this is something we really need to test for. This is something that varies quite a bit from device to, to device. Um, as we still establish these production processes. 
So this, um, this kind of shows how we improve these devices over time and how every device that has been shipped also benefits from the improvements from the device that we make in the future. So we, set a, we used to set aside all the Comet 2s that failed. Um, this is our first serious time doing production, so we'd, we'd do the tests. If it failed, either final provisioning or the stress test, we put it to the side, and it goes in a bin, and we just have walls and walls of um, particular failures, um, ranging from very minor things like we need to fix up some solder joints or something, to the CPU's too hot, um, this is some kind of device failure, or we, we need to do something more major um, to fix this. So CPU too hot around, I think, uh, September, October of last year was by far the um, biggest uh, and most common failure for the Comet 2s. So we reduced CPU usage in open pilot, and then we downclocked the CPU fairly significantly um, to get these devices to pass the stress test. And we went a little bit above and beyond here. We did a more extreme downclock, and the orange part of the histogram here is the devices that were too hot and failed the, the stress test after the down clock. And the blue ones are the device, all the devices we shipped before that with the current uh, clock frequency. So the devices that were too hot actually ended up being uh, running co even cooler than devices we shipped out before that passed the test. Um, and then every device in that blue category also benefited from this because we shipped an OTA update um, to the kernel and all the devices got cooler in the field. And then this is pretty cool. Here's a GIF of the screen calibration. Um, so we've thought about Comma 3 testing for a long time and how we're going to test them in production. And we got to do some fun stuff um, before we shipped out the first units. So I think it's, it kind of shows how far we've come um, from the Comma 2 a couple years ago to where we are at with the 3 right now, where we can, we can do things like this. And you look at them, and the stress test is, uh, let me go back to stress test. The stress test is, is pretty big. It's, it's, this is a small part of it. And you can see all these devices on the stress test, and their screens look exactly the same. This is, uh, we put a, a comma 2 next to the comma 3s yesterday. Um, and it's, the difference is incredible. These devices are really beautiful. And we have time to do things like this now um, in the capacity. So I think, I think you guys will be really happy with these devices. And then now we're going to take a trip to the comma zoo. Well, to the premier San Diego Zoo, which is the Kama Zoo. And we're going to talk about the Panda Jungle. So the Panda Jungle is what most of us who have a device on our desk use to uh, do replays and to de debug and develop OpenPilot. Um, so Panda Jungle essentially has a panda on it, and it has six OBDC ports. So you can plug in six comma two, six comma three, six pandas, whatever you want. Um, and this is how we do our hardware loop testing for pandas. This is how we develop OpenPilot on desks. Um, you can essentially emulate being in a car on your desk. Um, and it's an incredible debugging tool. Uh, and then now it has a working ignition button. We, we uh, shipped nine of these devices in the last, well, since we started selling them, we shipped nine of them. And uh, we just got the ignition button working. But we have an announcement. It's going to be one ninety nine now. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully uh, we'll get another nine people to buy them. And we have the next gen panda, red panda. So the red panda is based on an STM thirty two H seven. The previous generation of Panda was, best, was based on the STM32 F4. We've been doing work um, in the last three months to develop this device and bring it up. Uh, it's the future of the Panda platform. It supports CanFD, has a 4x faster CPU, and it's red. Um, so it's the, the same black Panda form factor um, in a red case without GPS. You'll be able to connect this to your comma 3 um, directly into that USB-C port. Um, and then you can buy one today, $299, and it ships in two to eight weeks. And uh, we're optimistic we'll have support in OpenPilot um, 
in the next release, 0.88. Right. Questions? Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple things there. Um, we're not quite at the scale of selling hundreds of thousands. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. But uh, as far as uh, reworking the devices, it, it, is, it costs a lot of time. Um, but it, it's really clear now that this time is really worth spending. Uh, it made every Comet 2 we ever shipped out much more reliable. Uh, and a much better product. Um, so I think right now the, the time we invest in, and we, we do this uh, kind of in stages. So we, we do the production process, we build devices, we set them aside, and then it's kind of like the find interesting loop. We look at the top failures, we fix them, um, or we evaluate what can we do about these. Can we improve processes? Can we improve uh, the software at all? Like, where can we do better? Um, and it turned out for the Comma 2, we, we fixed all the common failures, and this made all the devices that much better. You buy a Comma 2 today, um, and it's, it's incredibly well tested. Um, so yeah, it is worth spending the time, uh, but we do it in stages. We don't just you know, immediately rework them. Was there another component to your question? I think I covered everything. How can we catch them earlier? Yeah, so um, we, we try to push tests downstream as much as possible um, into the earliest stages. And we've gotten really good at this with the Comma 3s already, actually. Uh, we catch almost all the failures in, in final provisioning, which takes a couple of minutes. You build the device. Um, you flash it. Um, and there's a couple stages of flashing, actually. So we flash just the boards themselves, then we build it into a device, then we put Agnos on it, um, and then we do um, some final provisioning. And um, we, we've gotten really good at this, actually. So we, we do, we add these tests when necessary, and uh, yeah, the, the final provisioning tests are, are really quick. We're, we catch these super early in the production process, actually. We have another one up here, actually. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again. Uh, nice presentation. Nice work on, uh, on testing. One question I have uh, for you guys, uh, maybe like um, for improvement. Uh, are you guys planning on doing like some thermal cycling of the devices? Some thermal what? Cycling, like uh, freezing them basically like to minus 10 or minus 20 and then heating them up uh, pretty quickly because that's what really happens in practice, and uh, my device actually had a problem, comma two, after, after we slow the trip when it stayed outside and cooled down to minus 10, screen just stopped working. Okay, um, so I think your question about thermals, I, I couldn't quite understand. The, yeah, yeah, like uh, thermal that. testing, like do, do you guys plan on doing like thermal cycling? Of, yeah, of new so I, I think we, we plan to, we, we cover all the hardware right now um, pretty thoroughly, but there's a lot of room um, there's a lot of depth to go into um, and the testing. Our testing will get much better. We'll go through the same process we did with the Comma 2. The Comma 3 testing is where the Comma 2 testing, um, it, it kind of picked up from there. We didn't start over. So I think the Comma 3 testing will be really, um, I think it's quite incredible right now. I think it's going to get, you saw the screen calibration. Um, yeah, yeah. This is. But then what I'm saying is that uh, Comma is not, uh, not really, it's a little bit different from consumer electronics because uh, its operating condition can, can go from minus uh, 10, for example, Celsius to 
I don't know, 80 degrees pretty quickly. Yeah. So that's not your PlayStation like use case scenario usually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Just something for improve. Thanks. So with the red panda yeah. in the new car config or in the comma car configurator when you're trying to see if your car is supported, if you need a red panda to support your car, is that gonna show up in, in the configurator? Yeah, so this is something we, we, we could easily do. No cars require the red panda right now, but I think some cars are starting to ship, like some Genesis cars um, are starting to ship with CanFD. When a, when the first CanFD uh, car port comes in, we'll we'll handle this all nicely. Gotcha. And can you maybe speak to the what's on CanFD and why it's important to have that support in the Red Panda? Yeah, so it's just an upcoming uh, standard. It's, it's kind of the next step in CAN. Uh, the FD stands for flexible data rate. You can get more data through um, faster. So this is what the cars are going to be shipping with. We want to support it. It's also just changing one chip. So this is pretty cool. Um, we have one up here again. Uh, I'm sorry, another question on the red panda. Um, since there's a panda in the C2 or the C3 already, uh, how does that work? <laughs> do, do you bypass one, do you switch one off, how does? So you won't be able to use it with the Comma 2, um, unfortunately. Um, this isn't, like this is a hardware limitation, the Comma 2. It's the same reason you can't use a Comma Smays on a, on a Comma 2. Okay. Um, so I guess if you have an Eon, you can use the red panda, but um, an Eon Gold. So but, it It'll use the USB-C uh, port on the Comma 3. Oh, the spare one, okay, okay. Yeah, cool. we have one of our cars, uh, we have a red panda in one of our cars driving to the Comma 3. Okay, cool, thank you. So one of the things you listed was uh, MISRA C2012. Mm -hmm. Is that being applied to the Panda and also the um, OpenPilot? No, this is, so OpenPilot is considered QM uh, in terms of our functional safety analysis. Um, panda is where that kind of code rigor happens. Um, and this is where we designate um, the safety being enforced. Okay, and are you applying anything like then uh, CERT at all to the, uh, for security, another coding standard? Uh, considering, you know, making sure that the code is written a certain way so the, there's no vulnerabilities or anything like that. Uh, uh, MISRA does that in, in some sense, but wondering if there was any other standards that you were applying. Uh, MISRA, uh, you mean as far as coding standards yes, or as coding functional safety? Okay. Uh, coding standards. So we, uh, on the C code we also run, we just run some generic uh, stack analysis tools like CPP check. So we use CPP check, um, we use some other static analysis stuff, and then they have a MISRA add-on. And then we keep up to date with their MISRA add-on. We even, uh, we fix a couple bugs in there. Um, so we pretty actively um, work yeah to work towards MISRA C 2012. And for functional safety standards, are you then applying like uh, DO1, uh, uh, ISO 26262 process standards for? Yeah, so you can see, uh, it's pretty cool. If you go to Panda, you'll see we have two projects. We have an ISO 262 project and we have a SIL2 project um, from when we did our um, in-depth functional safety analysis. And we made a bunch of uh, issues and then you can see the, progr you can see the progress. Uh, all the ISO 262 stuff is almost done. All the cars that we officially support have full ISO 262 and Panda. Um, and you self-certify uh, uh, as well the code or the, the for, for safety standards? Like Yeah, the, there's no certifying body. There's here. no, okay. You said something about declocking uh, one of the chips to reduce the heat yeah. in Comma 2. Are all the comma twos that are out right now um, with the declocked? Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep, and running at about 55, 60% overall CPU. So this is well below our target for uh, 09, open mile 09. Thanks for the presentation. So well, the one question I have is uh, what will be the operating temperature for the comma three? Will have the same limitations that the comma two has? as far as maximum temperature that it can be run at? So the active cooling in the Comma 3 is, is quite a bit better. Uh, the thermal thresholds may be a little bit stricter because um, from what we've seen on our stress test, thermals are, are significantly better. We see about max temperature of 65C. Uh, You'll never see a Comma 2 with 65C. Um, and this is the max for the Comma 3. Um, it's, 
we might, we might be a little bit more strict, but it's because we can, we have more, um, we have more room to be strict. And uh, you, you'll see the active cooling is quite good in the COM3. Uh, Hey, how's it going? I'm curious what yield you guys tend to get on the production units, and when production units fail quality control, what tends to be the, the sort of common culprits? Yeah, so like I said, we, we do it in stages. Um, so we kind of establish processes, we write tests, and then production comes back after some period of time, a couple months or so, and they're like, okay, here's what failed uh, a lot. We also do, we have a lot of logging around this. That's why we were able to make these uh, cool histograms and stuff, comparing like all the commentaries we shipped up until now and then compare with the down clock. Um, so some of the common ones we saw with the commentary were like CPU too hot. Um, some of them don't have an IMEI. So we're able to filter, filter out a lot of the, like the raw Eco phones. There was tons of failures in those. Um, that's like kind of a cost we just have to eat. Um, so we, we do a lot of filtering at every level and there was, each kind of stage had its own uh, common failures. Stress test was CPU too hot mostly. Um, final provisioning usually uh, catches things like, oh, this device doesn't have a microphone, stuff like that. All right, Adib. Thank you so much. That was great.